Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our session on respectful Indigenous subject headings. My name is Dina Nebionquit, and I am the First Nations Consultant with Ontario Library Service. We are honored to welcome Stacey Allison Casson, a citizen of, of the Métis Nation of Ontario with kinship connections to the Georgian Bay Métis community and through the historic Northwest. An assistant professor at the School of Information Management at Dalhousie University, Stacy engages in work and research related to Indigenous matters in libraries and the wider cultural heritage sector. Stacy is a passionate advocate for change in information structures and metadata systems within the library profession. She is a chair of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institution Indigenous Matters Standing Committee and is the chair for the language preservation and instruction community with the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance. Stacy has extensive professional experience as a librarian serving in a variety of roles in the libraries at York University. Kache merci for being here, Stacy. And joining Stacy this morning is Annie Wolf, a 2007 graduate of La École de Biblioéconomie at the Sciences de l'Information at University of Montreal. Annie has since worked as a librarian in the Canadian Federal Public Service. She has held various positions at Library and Archives Canada in acquisition, cataloging, and reference, as well as in children's literature and stakeholder relations. She is now focusing on information standards, both ISO and CSH. She has also recently completed a second master's degree in French literature at the University of Ottawa. They've knew Annie. And lastly, our very own Bailey Urso Mayhe, a member of our Jazzy team, which will show us practical application of the work being done at Ontario Library Service. Jazzy stands for the Joint Automation Server Initiative, a program delivered by Ontario Library Service that provides equity for access to library services, technologies, and resources for Ontario's residents through a shared integrated library system. I will now hand things over to our speakers and invite you to pose any questions that you have in the Q&A box to be answered following the presentation. Miigwech. Thanks, Deanna. So, um, uh, hello to everybody. Very glad to be here today. I'm going to share my screen, I hope. Always a bit. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so yes, uh, thank you for, for being here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the project to create a respectful uh, terminology or framework for respectful terminology. Um, I'm here um, in association with the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance. Um, and so I wanna mention uh, Nicola right off the top. So this is um, a number of years in coming. Some of you listening may be aware of Nicola already. Um, so it is uh, an alliance that is uh, indigenous led. And so I'm going to invite you, if you have a moment, you can follow that uh, link. Um, on your own computer to uh, Nicola and look at our um, governance structure, our council. Um, we have um, co-leads uh, with Camille Collison um, from uh, University of Fraser Valley and the Taltan Nation and Jesse Boiteau, who's at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and is a member of the Métis Nation. So part of what uh, we're talking about today is the I say long history of uh, indigenous classification, subject headings, the ways we manage um, information across libraries. And although this topic is getting um, a lot of attention uh, lately, it is not not new. And we can see, here just from this timeline that we have this beginning with the Brian Deere classification in 1974, all the way through to um, what we have happening this year in 2022. So it is good to remember that this is actually not uh, a new initiative. There have been many indigenous um, peoples over the past 50 years, almost 50 years that have been working very hard to ensure there is respectful terminology, respectful 
uh, classification systems and ways of working. And again, through this conversation, it's important to um, look at or recognize the um, legacy of an ongoing, I suppose, uh, reality of colonization within Canada. And this does directly relate to um, library uh, information organizations, the ways that libraries handle materials, um, where we see that uh, libraries and archives, um, cultural heritage as a whole have played uh, a role in um, the removal of cultural artifacts from community, um, the ways that they have been uh, brought into organizations such as museums or libraries and archives have not been uh, respectful and certainly have been uh, breaking that connection to community. So at the current time, we have an opportunity to contend with that. And part of that does uh, relate to how we think about and work with description, with classification and subject headings. So information management relies heavily on identifiers. So we think of that as uh, classification. So how we class something where it sits on the shelf. So subject headings, how we describe those materials and keywords that provide access to materials. And as many of you may be aware, um, a number of those headings that are still in use in many, many um, public libraries and other organizations across Canada and indeed across the world are problematic. They're not only incorrect, they could be racist or disrespectful. And when people have to use these headings, for example, when they look for materials, there is uh, an impact that that has not only on Indigenous peoples, but on um, all, all communities. And we have to understand also that Indigenous knowledge and data sovereignty needs to be recognized as a human right. So all of these things come together to um, speak to these things. And so it's important for those working in libraries, archives, and cultural memory institutions to be able to uh, recognize and reflect Indigenous people's worldview. This is starting to move towards a better way of working, understand the valid validity and dynamic nature of oral traditions. So again, we are probably, many of us are aware that in libraries, only certain kinds of, of information or only certain kinds of materials were seen as being valid. And to look at how we, consider what decolonization means in the context of libraries. And that this is really a crucial, um, something we have to contend with in libraries. It isn't something that should be done uh, when there's time or when there's resources. It really is fundamental and the responsibility of all people um, in the country known as Canada. So the CFLA Truth and Reconciliation Report, um, you can follow this link to to read it, and I, I suggest that you do if you haven't seen it, um, was really important in its uh, formulation of 10 overarching recommendations that will move the library community towards uh, reconciliation. And many, many um, people from the library community were involved in the writing of this report. So again, I strongly encourage you to go and have a look at it if you have a moment. And so the things I'm going to be talking about next are, are in part meeting some of these recommendations. So I'm not going to read this whole slide deck out, but Indigenous knowledge is really fundamental to um, ensuring that we move towards reconciliation. Um, that also goes for respect, as I said, of worldviews, of language, of even how um, we move through space in libraries. And classification and space are not disconnected because we know that where materials sit in the library are really important. What materials are together on the shelf in a physical space actually impacts how community members use that space. So if you have indigenous creation stories next to fairy tales, for example, that is going to impact um, how a, uh, community member might move through that space, how they feel about that space. So there is, even though we talk about classification and it sometimes seems removed from these other issues, it is actually really fundamental to how we consider our library spaces as well. 
And so one of the recommendations in the report was to um, decolonize access and classification. Um, and again, I'm not going to read this whole uh, point out, but really it is we cannot continue to have problematic terminology or racist terminology in our library catalogs. And on the other hand, say we're moving towards reconciliation. It just those things don't go together. And um, some of you here may know uh, Dr. Jean Joseph, who uh, was for uh, a long time the head of the um, Basowitan, um, sorry, the Wewa Library at the University of British Columbia. And one of the, the things she has said and, and is uh, certainly been repeated quite a bit is it is a basic act of respect to be known by your own name. And we can think about how important our names are to ourselves, the names of our communities. And so being able to ensure that the names people call themselves are present in our library catalogs and not names that have been uh, bestowed by um, either colonial nations or, or other nations is really, really important. So uh, the Canadian Federation of Library Associations Indigenous Matters was formed after the release of that report. And some work was done on the First Nations Métis Inuit Indigenous Ontology. This is just a screen grab of some of that, of that work where members of that uh, uh, working group, and I wanna just mention Camille uh, Collison again, uh, Alyssa Cherry from UBC, uh, Tim Knight from York University and myself were the co-leads of the uh, what was called the red team where we worked on uh, leading the the construction of this ontology and it was really starting with this uh, community name uh, project to really think about how we uh, move towards recognizing the names the communities call themselves and how we might actually think about how we integrate that into a um, subject heading schema in a library catalog I'm also going to mention again, Nicola right now is coming out of those recommendations from that uh, TRC report, um, because again, it's the it's a national Indigenous organization led by um, Indigenous people, um, really meant to support uh, Indigenous um, uh, information workers and cultural heritage workers. So not specific to libraries, but thinking in that holistic way as we move across different uh, organizations is why it's an alliance and not an association. And now, so from that ontology project, um, we now are moving towards the respectful terminology project, which is under the umbrella of NICLA. And again, Camille Collison, who is my co-lead on this project, and we've been working to create a multilingual um, open and online platform to support respectful terminology work, which will be um, really set to work again across different silos so not only libraries thinking about how we can support uh, descriptive work metadata work from all different kinds of organizations different sizes of organizations different needs also recognizing many smaller um, organizations don't necessarily have a lot of infrastructure to be um, doing certain kinds of technical work so really thinking very carefully about how we support all different kinds of uh, organizations to be, be able to implement respectful terminology. Um, and again, you may have heard this already, but relationship building is a really, really important part of this project and working on this sort of path to reconciliation. So really thinking about, again, with intention about how we uh, create relationships, how we respect relationships, and how we work in a way that is not extractive. That's really important. So what we had happen in May, maybe some of you attended, we have a proposal for a national indigenous uh, terminology platform, as I was just speaking about. And it's really about ensuring that we have this respectful framework. So uh, Library of Congress subject headings, which many of you may use in your libraries or you may be aware of, is coming from, uh, is a construct of the American government created for uh, Congress in the United States. And so it has a very particular kind of framework and worldview. Our intention with this project is to say, if we are starting from 
the beginning, how do we create a framework that is uh, indigenous led, respects indigenous worldview as in constructed in a way that respects that from the very beginning versus adding indigenous headings to an existing uh, colonial system. And also integral to the system is to recognize um, indigenous rights and human rights at the heart of this system. So again, something like the Library of Congress subject headings that was not part or intentionally not part of that construct coming as it does from the American government. And looking at frameworks like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People to say, how do we create um, a terminology framework that has that recognition of Indigenous rights right at the forefront and right at the beginning. So it's not an add on to an existing system. And again, we have our four R's here. I would really strongly encourage you to check out uh, this, um, the four R's, you know, I don't have the link here, but you can Google uh, this if you don't know of it. Um, and that is a way of working that is really going to ensure that we are putting at the forefront um, the needs of Indigenous communities and working in a good way. I'm just going to flip through these other slides quite quickly, but this is where we are right now. So we're at an initial seed funding stage of our project moving through. This is a five or six year project through to a point where we will have ongoing uh, maintenance of our platform with a partner. So having it be a, a utility that can be used um, in day-to-day uh, -day work by um, libraries. I'm not going to read all of this, but this is the intention behind the project. So collaborative, Indigenous-led, really focusing on community contributions, and more than community and nation terms. So thinking again, really holistically about this idea of terminology right from the beginning. And as many of you, uh, especially from smaller centers may know, it's really important to think about sustainability and stability in this kind of work. Because when you work at a smaller um, institution or organization, it can be really hard to upkeep certain kinds of technologies or certain kinds of projects in the, in the long term. So really making sure that we're doing something with that sustainability um, and stability uh, as, a, as a really important function. Last little thing I'll mention, multilingual is really important at this project. Thinking about output formats, all of these kinds of things. And lastly, also ensuring that we're thinking about training in this project as well. So I'm just gonna speed through the rest of my slides here. Again, thinking about solidarity, recipro reciprocity and responsibility as we go through this project. You're gonna hear me, I've just repeated a whole bunch of things over and over because that's how fundamental it is to the important, um, to the project. And with that, I'm gonna just end here. So, and it's also really thinking about the future. So what can we give to future generations in terms of how we think about um, metadata is not something that's just current, but something that goes forward in the long term. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, end. I can see my stop share. Stop sharing. So thank you. And I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Annie. Thank you, Stacey. Um, let me share at my turn my screen. Worries. It's not working. Wait a minute. There you go. Does everything sounds good? Maybe not. Can someone tell me if you see my screen? No. Uh, hi, Annie. Uh, we we can't see your screen no? at the okay. moment. Let me see something here. Okay. Um, if you wanted to start, I can. You sent us a copy uh, the other day. And, That's fine. Okay. Let's do it again. All righty. Just to make sure that I'm doing it right, like this. Aha. There. Now it's working. You we got see. it. Awesome. Okay. 
<clears throat> so yes, thank you, Stacy. Um, so hello, uh, again, my name is Annie Wolf and I am a senior librarian in information standards at Library and Archives Canada. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land that I'm presenting myself today is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And thank you for the invitation to present LEC's efforts in uh, changing CSH in a more respectful vocabulary. So, CSH is a subject headings list developed by Library and Archives Canada, and it contains over 2,000 subject authority records in the English language on Canadian topics. The list is not intended to be exhaustive. Subject headings are created only as needed. The existing CSH do not reflect current terminology used by First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis Nation for describing material with Indigenous content. So the goal of this project is to make the terminology in the catalog more accurate and respectful. Ongoing updates are needed uh, to remove bias, improve access, and look for new ways of describing. The way we describe items needs to be revised as well as the vocabulary. We definitely looked to examples set by others. Many organizations have created their own ontologies and list of subject headings like the Manitoba Archival Information Network, the Wewa Library, the FNMI ontology released through NICLA, and the Greater Victoria Public Library. These provided examples from other organizations doing similar work to inform our own. As a um, control vocabulary written in MARC, we do have to follow the same structural rules with LCSH, CSH, and RVM. The revision of existing bibliographic records is possible, but we have to realize that WorldCat is a shared environment. Anyone with an OCLC account can change bibliographic records, including clients who use other vocabularies. Unfortunately, our LAC records are not protected for, from a third party corrections. It is important to mention that we learn from others who have the knowledge LAC cannot improve CSH without the direct contribution of First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis Nation, as well as library communities. We are grateful for the sharing of Indigenous knowledge from our first discussions that help identify more appropriate terminology. And NICLA, like we all learn, <laughs> is the National Indigenous Knowledge and Languages Alliance. This is the kind of authority we need to move forward with changing subject headings. We are looking forward to working with them and learning from them on appropriate terminologies and practices. So to date, we have modified 119 CSH out of a total of 631. 40 CSH were deleted because a suitable alternative in LCSH was already available. 390 CSH have been added several of which were lost during the migration of the, to WMS, our new catalog. We still have 21 CSH to change and many more to add, but we need more input from communities to identify the right vocabulary. This is what we are doing right now. To see the complete list of all CSH, please visit our website, mark21.ca. In addition, an Excel list dedicated to Indigenous CSH only is also available at this address. And the new updated list appeared in September. Let me just drink, sorry about that. So <clears throat> you can see here some examples from updated CSH. Although we had previously revised some literature headings like Canadian literature, English, native authors had been revised to Canadian literature, English, indigenous authors. Upon further reflection, we have decided to remove the word Canadian as an adjective. Thus using our previous example, Canadian literature, English, indigenous authors is now indigenous literature, English, and may be subdivided geographically as appropriate. Other literature headings are similarly established, like Inuit drama, French, First Nations, fiction, Métis, Esses, English, etc. Note that there are a small handful of headings in LCSH that follow a similar pattern and can be used where appropriate, such, such as Inuit poetry, 
for a collection of poetry in Inuit languages by multiple authors. Please refer to CSH authorities for notes and examples of appropriate subdivisions under each heading. There are also some examples of headings like Native Art Canada that we deleted because Indigenous Art Canada was already in LCSH. As an umbrella term, we can use Indigenous peoples or other headings with the word Indigenous, which already exists in LCSH for works that are about collectively First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nations, peoples, and topic. We can continue to use headings that contains the word Inuit and Métis as appropriate to the word being cataloged. In order to replace the LCSH heading I Word of North America, we created the heading First Nations for works on First Nations peoples and subjects. Geographical subdivisions can be added where appropriate to specify Canada or Canadian jurisdictions. Of course, our goal is to be even more specific. Subject headings for the majority of First Nations communities and languages will be revised on an ongoing basis. Additional CSH will also be created in the near future to allow for greater specificity about communities and geographical regions. We are making these changes with the best of our knowledge. It is important to mention that nothing is final. If an improvement can be made, even after modifying a CSH, we will not hesitate to change it again. <clears throat> so changing the CSH brings its share of challenges, but we are not alone. NICLA, like I already mentioned, is a National Indigenous Knowledge and Languages Alliance. This new player could be an important key. Their three executives are well-recognized Indigenous leaders in the library, museum, and archives world. They are definitely experts in both subject headings and Indigenous culture. LAC has contacted the Library of Congress years ago to find out if they have any plans to change the disrespectful Indigenous subject headings. For LC, the, the process of change is very politicized and we can see it with illegal aliens. Um, so the answer was no at the time, but they confirmed to us that LEC could go ahead with the changes of CSH, which we did. Usually before creating a new CSH, we request it um, to LCSH through a platform, uh, and then we have to wait several months before receiving a response. In short, with the sheer number of CSH to modify, as well as the pressure of time, this process was effective, yes, but not efficient. So <clears throat> we decided to change the CSH first, and then we will share our list with the Library of Congress in a less formal way. This summer, LC has announced uh, that they are going to look at making changes to LCSH. We have already discussed our experiences with them and are looking forward to being part of their discussions moving forward. LAC is looking forward to welcoming the new changes if they are consistent with our updated CSH. Oh, sorry, I'll come back here. LAC's catalog is hosted um, by OCLC. As already mentioned in this presentation, WorldCath is a shared environment Anyone with an OCLC account can edit bibliographic records, including clients who use other vocabularies. Unfortunately, our LEC notices are not protected from a third party corrections. However, OCLC recently contacted us to announce the upcoming arrival of a new feature in their catalog. The new feature could hide inappropriate words Without, however, correcting the bibliographic records, this functionality would give us the chance to work in depth, while visually the catalog would be less offensive. This is not uh, available yet, but stay tuned. So you can see that CSH is only a very small part of this gigantic, it's so important work. So now we continue to gather input from indigenous and library communities and others in order to make appropriate updates. We believe that it is important to support other initiatives such as NICLA, LC, et cetera. We uh, work with RVM to recommend equivalents in French 
and support their efforts uh, to update French headings. We will manually update headings currently in CSH authority records, as well as reviewing together how we describe indigenous items and how we create indigenous headings in the future. We cannot, of course, do our entire next steps on our own. We will definitely need input and guidance for, from the community. And on a broader level, we are also looking to other ways like classification and processes to make our descriptions more respectful for other communities like the LGBTQ2 plus community, for example. Until there, the work continues. We are open to all suggestions. So please do not hesitate to email us and I will, back, I will get back to you personally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, Stacy, so very much for the informative introduction to the important work that you do. I wish we had all morning to talk about just those things, uh, but we were limited by time to some degree. Um, so my name is Lee Potifat, and I am the Training and Events Coordinator here at Ontario, Ontario Library Service. And I'm joined by my colleague, Brandon Fratercangeli, uh, who is also a consultant with us here at the OLS. I'm going to pass it over to Brandon as he has a question that we would like to pose to the two of you and hopefully get some rich discussion throughout. Over to you, Brandon. Thank you, Lee, and, and thank you, Stacey and Annie. Um, you, you, we cover, or both of you covered a lot of ground in a, um, very little time this morning. And um, you know, one of the, um, one of the topics that, um, you know, that, that you talked about I'd like to kind of expand on is, um, is the relationship building role. And also, um, you know, Stacey, you were mentioning the four R's. Um, and, you know, as your presentations have shown, um, you know, there are various subject heading uh, projects uh, that have been implemented or are being implemented to ensure respectful terminology. Um, we're even aware of uh, some libraries implementing customized subject headings uh, to work towards this goal. Um, and Stacey, you mentioned the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People, um, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Call to Actions were um, mentioned, and even uh, the Canadian Constitution um, has, you know, a clause about uh, the rights of Indigenous people to be consulted. Um, when it comes to uh, subject headings, classification systems, um, and cultural and memory institutions, and specifically libraries, um, how does the concept of um, consultation, how should it be implied? Um, you know, what relationships uh, need to be uh, built? Um, um, so, and, and I guess kind of of the same, uh, same lens. Um, there, there's also the, um, the the technical aspect of you know once there's a agreement in uh, subject headings, um, you know what is the ability or what should the ability to be flexible actually you know be at the um, you know throughout this process. So I'll I'll turn that over uh, to uh, to you. Um, well, there's a lot to unpack in that, mm -hmm. in that yes. question. So, um, so maybe I'll start and, and mm -hmm. think about, you know, I think in both our presentations, mm -hmm. you heard a lot about how um, relationships are important, consultation, mm -hmm. also recognition is important. So recognition, recognizing where your um, information comes from, um, who, who did you listen to or hear, like that is actually also an important part of, of, um, of this work in this area is recognizing, as Annie said, you know, this is not frequently things that come out of nowhere. There is, mm -hmm. a, there is a, you know, a, a sort of, I want to say multiple lineages of, of especially Indigenous, um, really activists in this area who have been doing this work for many, many years or have done it. So I think that's uh, an important piece. And, you know, consultation, we know is also um, important and increasingly recognized as a, as a key um, mechanism for recognizing Indigenous rights in this area, but it's also really, really complicated. And, mm -hmm. and there aren't, there isn't like a set of instructions on, 
you know, this is step one, this is step two, because it doesn't, doesn't really work that way. And it's Mm -hmm. not going to be effective if you're at an organization and you're, and you're trying to also copy something that's done some somewhere else. So it really is about that relationships and listening and, um, I'm trying to think of like, you know, we're not going to be able to tackle all the things in this short period of time. So I would say listening is also really important. Maybe sometimes you're at a, a library and there is something that you really want to do or your library wants to do, but you know, the indigenous communities in your area, that's maybe not something that, that is something they want to do. <laughs> so it's just mm-hmm. being aware that sometimes initiatives that we might think of as being important in certain kinds of library perspectives are not necessarily you know, on the top of the list of, of community also to just be aware of what, of, of sort of timelines as well. So mm-hmm. often there's sort of a timeline um, mismatch or can be. Um, and again, I think it's, it's that relationships, listening, um, really being prepared if you are coming from an organization. And something maybe I'll just mention about the specific topic of of subject headings. And I think Annie spoke to this really well, and I think is actually a really important change in the ways that that, um, libraries and institutions are approaching the work of subject headings and classifications is a a willingness to change um, Mm -hmm. and not to to keep things the same way for a long period of time. It used to be, I know when I was first cataloging, you would catalog something and then you would never touch it again. Like that was it. It was just like, we don't have time. We don't have time to go back and we don't have time to load all these changes. Like we all, many, many libraries, especially technical services departments are under-resourced. I think it's my personal opinion. It's one of the more under-resourced areas in a lot of, a lot of libraries. And so this recognition or willingness to make changes as needed is really important and really is about listening to community. And I think Mm -hmm. it's also important to recognize that when we say community really should be communities Mm -hmm. and to recognize that, you know, it's not, you you cannot talk with one, you know, even group in in a community and think that you have an answer to all of the the questions because even, you know, I was at a, a talk a few, maybe it was last year and talking about you know, Cree language or Cree community or Nahiwa com- communities, like there, there is not one. And even in a geographic area, you might have many different ways of approaching a topic. So I think it's going to be a really important question for us to grapple with when we talk about things that we have used to, we're used to them being really static and mm-hmm. we have to be more open to change. I think that's really important and to recognize, give over some of that control as well in terms of thinking about structure. So I'm going to stop there before I go on too much longer. Uh, and what really stood out um, from what you were saying, uh, Stacy, is that um, need for flexibility, the non-staticness of things and um, the ability to listen. So um, I, I'd like to uh, go over to Annie and ask her about uh, Library and Archive Canada's, um, you know, in- initiatives uh, when it comes to uh, consulting with Indigenous communities or Indigenous organizations like NICLA. And um, you were saying, Annie, also in your uh, presentation that uh, LAC went forward with some changes before Library of Congress, you know, had any input in that. So um, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Annie. Thank you. Yes, I think, well, Stacy speaks so well. I don't know what I can add. Um, <laughs> um, I think we really need to, first of all, open our hearts. That's the first thing we should do. Like, as a settler, I'm, I, don't, I don't know a lot. So I really need for myself to be knowledgeable. And I would say like a little tip and and cues or something for everyone out there. Don't wait for your organization to tell you to attend a class, to attend a conference, to uh, register to a workshop. Do it for yourself. Do it for yourself first. And there are so many courses, classes, workshop, even readings, even novels. There's a lot of really good indigenous novel out there. Like just embrace Embrace the knowledge and open your heart. And then as a librarian, you will be 
a little bit more open and have the willingness to, to play with those control vocabulary that is so tight usually and be a little bit flexible. So that's why it starts with you and, and, and then you can apply it to, 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 to your organization for after that. And um, I think we, we saw it, like you mentioned with our approach um, that is perhaps uh, exemplified by the creation of the subject heading um, First Nations. So this subject heading is slightly unconventional uh, in that it does not follow patterns established by Library of Congress subject headings, but however, uh, establishing this new heading um, filled a pressing need that was infinitely more important than following traditional subject classification mm -hmm. practices. So the heading First Nations does not employ a parent I'm not a cataloger, let me say that again, parenthetical parent <laughs> qualifier that you uh, that you can see uh, with similar headings like um, Maori, Maori uh, New Zealand people. We have allowed the scope notes and the fact that the heading is part of the CSH uh, subject file to explain that the heading is to be used for First Nations people residing in what we now know as Canada. So, but even then, open your heart. That's, that's the beginning of everything. And what a lovely way to summarize this entire topic. You know, if you're starting from there, it's hard to make a mistake. Um, we're just going to quickly go over to the audience Q and A's now. Um, so the very first one is about the um, name and or subject authority records and if they're available online. Uh, so I don't know, Annie, if you want to answer that, type the answer directly into that Q&A so that everyone has it as a resource, that would be great. Um, the next question states that recognizing that some library systems have taken a, if it's not officially listed by the publisher, we can't use another subject heading stance. How would you encourage individual library systems to make use of these subject headings for existing records? So. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll jump in and, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's Annie again was, Annie was speaking so well to the, like the, the be bold. Like, I think we're at a point where you can't wait for your, organization or the Library of Congress or, you know, I think there's, and, and there's a tension too, because we, you know, we also know making changes in catalogs is not light business, right? It is, has tendrils of, of, it has implications because it can impact things. You have to keep track of it. There's a lot of, of intricacies, technical intricacies that are that are often, I think, more of the challenge than the actual willingness to make the change. I think that that the the change is my sense at this point is many many libraries organizations are willing to make the changes if if they're felt to be the right change, but it's some of the technical infrastructure that really is the blockage point and the challenges of maintaining a catalog, and so. You know, I think that's the, it does take resources. So I, I guess, what am I trying to say here? So if it's possible and that is the right heading, you should just make the change, but recognizing, I wanna recognize that it's not, it's easy for me to say <laughs> sitting here and it's harder to do in person when you know what the implications are. But I, again, looking to what Annie was saying, I think it's, we have to change, like a lot of our practices are, in this under-resourced kind of environment of, of being really cautious around doing things that are not um, standard and doing things that are gonna cause messes in a way, if I could say that. And that's been, there's been a lot of hesitation around that. And that, so I think it's partly also looking future forward is how we actually change our, the practice of, of description and the practice of using just, how, Headings, but so, um, and this is where we can look to organizations like OCLC or even Ontario Library uh, Service in terms of like how do some of those um, vendors or services that we use, you know, it's not just the individual library, it's also 
the other kinds of products, the vendors that we engage with also need to be making those changes. So we're not stuck trying to push something into a system that is not generous or is not working in a way that we need it to, to work. So it is a nested problem. And we have to also direct pressure to some of these other areas that have been able to just keep up business as normal in terms of not allowing the kind of flexibility that we really need to build into our systems and practices at that really wide level. I don't know if that answers the question entirely. <laughs> oh, I think it absolutely does. Um, and there's a, there's a follow-up question to that I'm going to ask. Uh, but first, Annie, there is a question and it states uh, the functionality Annie mentioned at LEC about the hide of older and offensive subject headings. Are they and will they still be searchable? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, yeah, th th that's a, a feature that OCLC will apply and it's um, on our catalog. We can be part of it or not. So we choose to be part of it. Um, so each time there's a word that is offensive, we can put something else on it that doesn't remove anything under. And it's temporary. Of course, because the goal is to have like effective terminology. So by that time, we are working uh, on the back to make sure that uh, we correct um, the subject headings. But in the meantime, there will be like we kind of we kind of call it a bind aid. Like it's just like something temporary uh, on it. Uh, it doesn't change the records, so it, they are both searchable. Okay, thank you, Annie. We have time for, we have about four minutes for one more question, and then we would like to showcase quickly the work that the Ontario Library Service is doing in the back end to, to kind of bookend this entire presentation. So the final question is, our community elders expressed having consultation fatigue, but library leadership really wants to press on with consultation, very difficult. So do you have any advice for public libraries in how to navigate this difficult subject? It is difficult and I'll just speak, um, I'll just try to take off my library Nicola hat for a moment and just say from even in my own community, I, I last year put, or sat as a, I was an elected member of my local community council and so I sat on two, um, and I'm trying to remember the acronym, but Indigen Indigenous Advisory Councils for School Boards. And really just for our, our geographic area, I think we had six um, councils that we were supposed to have representation and we just really did not have the people available who could sit on all of those councils and um, and do that work yet those councils are legislated and I mean they're important and they're legislated by the Ontario government for example and so absolutely consultation fatigue and and so I think listening to your local community if they are if there is fatigue then then you have to be mindful of that I mean there is again limited number of people who are available to take and take on these roles and it is hugely hugely important and it is uh, time consuming so think about ensuring that when you're consulting you are prepared I think that's a really important part that it's not you know that that time and experience is is um valuable and and I don't want to say a limited this is like a resource but I don't mean it like that but I but I think you have to be really cautious because if you are in a position where there's a lot of fatigue that's not going to be good for your organization and so really again listening being reciprocal being respectful those four r's again and really thinking about what does the community need? Is it you always going to the community and asking for something um, instead of the other way around? And so there's not, um, you know, I think it's a challenging time in some ways because there is such a, a push for consultation, but there's, you know, I just am speaking for myself. So this is, this is me speaking, not at an institutional level, but the, you know, it's, it is tough. And so, um, you know, be mindful, be appropriate, look to those four R's and really see if how you, if there's an expression of fatigue, then, then you have to change what's happening because that's, that's obviously not a good way um, forward. 
Great, thank you for that. So now, yeah, that was very difficult, very difficult to approach, so thank you for breaking it down. Um, now we'd like to provide a short video from one of our amazing team members at Jazzy, showcasing the practical side of the work that's happening in the back end at OLS. So please bear with me while I quickly share my screen here. Okay, make sure that you can hear it, great. So we'll do... Hello, my name is Bailey Urso Mahi, and I'm a Jazzy Support Analyst Ontario Library Service. Today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the ongoing OLS and Jazzy project to update subject headings in our consortia's integrated library system catalog to reflect respectful Indigenous terminology. We have undertaken this action in support of the Canadian Federation of Library Associations Truth and Reconciliation Report Call to Action Number Five to decolonize access and classification by addressing the structural biases in existing schemes of knowledge organization and information retrieval arising from colonialism by committing to integrating Indigenous epistemologies into cataloging practice and knowledge management. JASI stands for the Joint Automation Server Initiative and is a consortia purchasing program administered by the Ontario Library Service that provides equity of access to library services, technologies, and resources for Ontario's residents through a shared integrated library system. Currently, the consortia has over 120 library members and over 800,000 title records in the ILS. In early 2022, with the guidance of the JASI Advisory Group, we engaged Library Services Center, LSC, to begin to an update of the colonial subject headings in the JASI catalog, which affects the records of all the JASI consortium members. LSC has developed a set of respectful Indigenous subject headings based on the collaborative work of the Greater Victoria Public Library and is continuing this work in partnership with many organizations, including NICLA. The JASI team ran reports within the ILS for records using colonial subject headings. 10,860 records from the JASI catalog were flagged, meaning that the 650 fields contain colonial subject headings. Records were exported from the ILS and sent to LSC in a MARC file. LSC insert, inserted the corresponding respectful Indigenous subject headings into the MARC files and sent them back to us. We are now going through the process of importing those records back into the catalog. This is an example of a record in the JASI catalog prior to the updates. I have highlighted the 650 field that has the colonial subject headings. This is an example of a record in the JASI catalog after the LSC updates were completed. Colonial subject headings will remain in the MARC record alongside the respectful subject headings for searchability and education. The updated 650 fields were given a second indicator of four, meaning local or unspecified heading. This will allow for easy identification of records that have been updated through the process. Jazzy and LSC will complete annual updates to the catalog. So in one year's time, we will look at the catalog and export any new records that have been added with colonial subject headings. These will be updated by LSC to have corresponding respectable Indigenous subject headings and imported back into the ILS by the Jazzy team. It's important to note that this is a continuous process. As language changes, LSC's respectable subject headings will be updated to reflect those changes. In conclusion, this undertaking of exporting and updating mass records from the Jazzy Consortia catalog was the first of its kind for the OLS. LSC has also indicated that this is the biggest project it has completed. The Ontario Library Service is pleased to take these steps towards decolonizing the Jazzy Consortia catalog and look forward to continuing to work together with LSC. If you have any questions about this process and this project, please do not hesitate to reach out. My name is Bailey Urso Mahi, but you can contact any of the members of the Jazzy team by visiting our website or emailing us at the email listed here. Thank you for your time. I'm on mute, of course. Uh, as Lee uh, mentioned, we just wanted to bookend uh, this, uh, uh, this session with um, a, a, just a quick show and tell of, of the practical details um, of, uh, of updating MARC records. Um, um, with that, I would like to thank Stacy and Annie so much for their contributions to our conference. Um, 
today. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experience with public libraries across Ontario uh, for helping us better understand some of the uh, issues surrounding uh, a respectful Indigenous subject headings and terminology. Um, for all conference attendees, please note that we will now have a 10 minute break uh, between sessions. Um, so please ensure to return to the main lobby and to join us for our next session, which is a lunch and learn, where we'll be screening the documentary, change the subject beginning at 12.15. Uh, and you know, we'll be continuing on uh, the topic of subject headings and classification systems with this documentary. Uh, we provide the link uh, in the chat as well. Thank you everyone. <laughs>